Hey everybody, welcome to the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. I am your host, John Santiago, and this episode is a little bit different. Um, we don't have a guest today. Instead, mm-hmm. I am bringing on my producer, Nikki Vicente, to chat with you. Hey There's Nikki for everybody to see and hear if you are listening to the podcast, watching on YouTube. Um, and we are going to be talking just about the first 10 episodes of the show, a recap, if you will, of what we've done so far on the podcast. And um, I just wanted to do this as uh, here going into the 11th episode rather than, you know, jumping right into another episode with a guest because 10 episodes, you know, for a new podcast, that I'd say that's a pretty good milestone and accomplishment and achievement for us. <laughs> um, and so... It's it, yeah. It's a good time for us to just um, reflect on what it is that we've been able to do so far and what we've learned from the guests who've been on. So, um, again, I have Nikki here, and unfortunately, we had an intro that was much better than this one that was recorded. <laughs> but I wasn't recording. I was not recording the. Uh, on it my happens end with to the my, best of us. Yes, it it does. Like I, even me. Like, well, clearly, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit rusty at this hosting thing. So, <laughs> first of all, again, thank you, Nikki, for joining me on this episode of the Video Craft Show. And let's just start there with what uh, what stood out to you. What are some things that really stuck out in these first um, few episodes of the sh- of the uh, of the podcast? None of these creators i was and i was aware of none of these creators before um coming on the show but it was fun learning about um uh these content creators because i wouldn't have discovered them any other way but some of the things that stood out to me well let's first let's start with the first um guest that you had that we had jake matthews he's a photographer and one of the things that really stuck to me was like he was talking about how when he comes on a photo shoot he likes to treat people as people and he doesn't go like with with, he doesn't go in with this dslr and like tries to act all professional professional and stuff like he just chills and he talks to the the models the people on the on the set and uh, yeah i think that's a good attitude to carry and any job in general because i mean if we are i I think there's this there's this um idea that if you're in a film set or you're you work in i don't know content creation or you're on camera all the time like like you're this personality that has to be on all the time but it's nice to be able to hear from someone like him i mean he's a photographer he's behind the camera but it's nice that he has these tactics and how to make the the model feel more comfortable and just treat them like people and not have them just look at you through the camera like he likes to make eye contact and stuff so yeah that really i i that stuck to me when he said that so great let's roll that clip and so this is like in my opinion the number one like most important thing to at least to like my career and i try to share it with other photographers and videographers as well just like how important your ability to connect with someone is and to make them feel comfortable. Because I think a lot of times as creatives, we get so used to being with a camera and we don't realize that for quote unquote normal people, that's such a weird thing for them. And then being in front of a camera is something they're not used to and they may feel awkward um, in front of. So it's first off just kind of acknowledging that they may feel uncomfortable. And secondly, one thing that I do is like, I don't try to take myself too seriously. I never try to show up on on a shoot and act like the most professional businessman there. Like, it's nothing like that. Like, I want to show up and talk to somebody like they're my friend. And oftentimes, I'll find myself intentionally goofing off, acting like an idiot, solely because then they'll start laughing at me and realizing, oh, he doesn't care if he looks stupid. So, like, neither will I. But it's just kind of like me joining in and, like, putting myself in the story as well. I see so many people um, when they're shooting videos, they just kind of stand behind the camera and they just kind of are sitting there looking at the camera, not even making eye contact with the subject. And they're just saying, no, that's not good. Let's do it again. Like, no, let's just do it again. 
and I will like see the subject kind of start to go into their shell, feel more uncomfortable, feel under pressure. And for me, it's just all about remembering that at the end of the day, like you are there with another human and that matters and treating them like a friend and connecting with them like you would want a friend. And I think that that opens up so many doors to just simply making people feel comfortable. And once they're comfortable, then I feel like their story can truly come out and shine. But is this something that you you learned from just experience or was this something that you learned from from other people that you worked with who were more experienced in, in video than you? Where, where did you kind of pick up on these things? So ironically, how I picked up on it technically really has not anything to do with video. Um, it was more uh, so before I was ever even a photographer, a videographer, I actually um, did a lot of public speaking and work kind of and actually like in more of a ministry way, but it involved me leading like being with small groups and connecting with people and learning how to just interact with them. Um, and it taught me kind of at a young age to really just pay attention to people and to listen when they talked and to notice signs that they were uncomfortable or stuff like that. But it was really um, not anything that had to do with photo or video. Once again, it was just me spending so much time with people and learning how to invest in them and like learning how to like care for humans. And then that transition, it was just an ironic transition, but it transitioned really well into my video work as well. Um, but it was just, I don't know, this may dumb it down too much, but it was just learning how to be a good friend to people and like learning how to be a good brother, a good son and what that looked like. And, um, and I think that allowed me to learn to treat other people better and therefore be able to tell their story better. All right. You know, that, that was something also that did really stick with me as well from that particular episode. Um, I think so often creators or not necessarily creators, but we as people just tend to forget like you know creators are people and dealing <laughs> you're dealing with people when you even if you're dealing with brands you know for example right like he i talked to him a lot about dealing with with brands and he he just right. had this um he just made a great point of of really acknowledging that you're dealing with like another person so just treat so just treat who you're talking to like another person and usually you will get respect back in return. Right. Exactly. And like I said it it applies to all sorts of jobs. You know, not just not just in content creation, like all sorts of jobs. So it's a universal piece of advice, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me when from that conversation the other things that really stuck out were um you know, we talked a lot about traveling. He's a very well-traveled guy. I mean, he's been, you know, to to Africa, to parts of Europe, um, you know, Asia, all over the world. And it was really interesting to hear him talk about how that influenced and impacted the way that he, um, you know, that that he he sees his creativity and 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 tries to explore his creativity as a creator. I thought that was really cool. Right. Like he was talking a lot about how much curiosity plays a part in how he creates content. Because he was talking about this experience with his dad when he was younger, that they would just sit down and people watch. And I guess that's something that he brought into his adulthood when he travels, like, Obviously, he's curious about these cultures and countries. That's why he travels to these places. So, yeah, that's something that's a nice um, uh, thing to practice. That's a nice practice to have when you're, if you're a creator, is to just slow down and be curious about your surroundings. Because that's what he talked about that a lot um, as well, too, when he's traveling. Like, he likes looking at how people act, what people, what people wear, what people do. It's just being curious about those things that plays a big part when you're when you're a creator that you have to see all the small details that maybe not everyone sees. So yeah, that's what really that's what I remember most about Jake Matthews. Yeah, curiosity is just such a big big thing and that was another thing too that I that really resonated with me in terms of that episode was just talking about 
you know, how important it is to be curious. And I think curiosity is something that guides me personally in my life. So it was very inspiring to hear somebody who is doing so well creatively as, as Jake is, um, to really, um, promote that idea as well. So, all right. So what's next? What other, what other clips from, uh, the first 10 episodes of the, uh, of the podcast right. uh, really stood out to you. From Martin Wong, he's a cosplay photographer, which is really interesting. Like he does these crazy shoots, different costumes and different sets. And he's really big on, on Instagram, right? And you guys were talking about yes. um, how to avoid <laughs> burnout as a content creator. And he was talking about how content creation is a very repetitive process. It's, a cycle that never ends like once you start something and then you create it and then it's done you have to think about creating another thing again <laughs> and then going through the process of com- finishing that project again and so i guess that's why burnout is so common when it comes to to content creators and he, he was giving tips on how you know um you have to be aware of like when you should take a break because then if you're not aware, then you experience burnout. And it's funny because at the end of that clip, you're asking him, "Does do you apply this to your own life?" And he's like, "No." <laughs> let's t- let's take that clip and play it for everybody to revisit. People crave new content, especially with um, social media these days. Uh, attention span is extremely short. They want new content all the time, new refreshing content. Um, and yes, to a creator, they're making new content. But to get to making new content, you're doing a very, very repetitive process, which is very ironic because you are trying to be a creator, a content creator to escape a routine nine to five job. But this job actually comes with a very big routine kind of style, which is the repetitiveness of creating itself. Like uh, you have to brainstorm what are you making and how is that going to be different from the content you make last week? Uh, like if some people might make the same content, but they still have to be different in a certain way. You cannot post the same picture 10 times a month. So you have to always repetitively doing a process of thinking how to create, when to create, um, and exactly how it's going to capture the audience. So this repetitive process will get burnout if you don't understand that is part of work. So I, I know one thing you want to explore a lot is the work-life balance. And if you don't separate yourself from work and have set a time for yourself, then you won't enjoy it. And like, and also like people don't understand, um, when, if you don't separate the two, you're going to blend the two together and you do not know when to stop. It's better to take breaks than to try to be work continuously. Like, like, um, a month ago I took like, almost a five days break, which is like, I'm not making anything today. I'm just going to play video games, watch content, watch YouTube, watch Netflix, and don't think about making things yet. You know, I don't even email people and message people because I know after that break, I feel so refreshed. I can go back full in my creativity and my efficiency going to be so much higher. It's similar to you not sleeping for 24 hours working versus you sleep like six hours, then you work six hours, then you maybe take two hours nap and then work another, you know, I don't know, eight hours. So that eight hours and that, you know, six hour work that you did gonna be total 14 hours. It's gonna be more efficient than 24 hours continuous working because as a, you know, economist, you're gonna hit uh, marginal returns. Your, your creativity, your productions, whatever it is, is yes, it's gonna increase, but it's gonna be increased at a decreasing rate. So you need to refresh that to cause your production rates to be higher as well as you go along. And taking breaks will help that. How how often do you take breaks yourself, like throughout the year? <laughs> Not enough, definitely. But... <laughs> <laughs> the irony, right? Know, it's like you right? gotta take breaks. I was preaching it. I'm like, yes, you need to take breaks. Like, I don't have time to take a break. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That. <laughs> That when I did ask him that follow up question, he's like, "No, I'm not very good at it at all." <laughs> he's like, "I'm not very good at, at at doing that," and it's it's hard. Like I think, in you know, 
that's one of the challenges of being a creator because you are essentially, you know, running your own business. And mm-hmm. and if you're thinking and seeing um, your content creation career from like an entrepreneurial lens, like a lot of entrepreneurs don't, they don't take breaks. Like they're constantly working mm-hmm. on whatever it is that they're that they're making um and mm-hmm. especially i think what's what's difficult too is like when um you know this these are careers you know as a content creator this is a career that's supposed to be fun cuz everybody sees you like yeah he has like the coolest you know the coolest potential um right. you know, the coolest job really ever it's just like he goes and takes photos of people you know, doing cosplay of like their favorite video game characters or anime characters. Mm-hmm. You know, he also, I mean, hangs out with very beautiful women, which I'm sure is also like quite a perk <laughs> as well. But you know, right. it's um, it's a job. It's a job, even though it's it's creative work. At the end of the day, it still turns mm-hmm. into a job, especially once you start earning earning money from it. And if, especially mm-hmm. if you're like him and it's become like a full-time career for you, then, you yeah. know, it, it, work can always get you down at, at points, even if it's something that you're very passionate about, you know, like I, I've felt yeah. that way in the past. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've mentioned on the podcast before, I think pretty sure in past episodes, but I'll reiterate again. I used to work in professional sports. You know, I worked in the NBA for right. for many years, actually. And that's supposed to be fun. You're watching people play basketball. You know, you're getting paid to do that. Right. Um, you're watching games for free that people pay, you know, hundreds of dollars to go to. But it becomes a job. And it's, that's, you know, when it's a job, it becomes, uh, you know, it can get tiring from time to time. Right. I guess what we can learn from here is that no matter how glamorous a job looks like from the outside, it still has some bumps um, for the people doing the job. Like I bet Kim Kardashian, like no matter how glamorous her life looks, I bet she still has problems too that we will never know of. (laughs) Yeah. No, and I know that some people watching this may like roll their eyes and say like, "Oh, why are we worried about Kim Kardashian?" But <laughs> that's the same thing I think people feel about again like other creators too. Like I I believe too. I totally agree with you too uh, what you're saying about Kim Kardashian. You know, I think that <laughs> she's clearly very smart about how she approaches building up her personal brand, right? And she's a creator right. too, essentially. You know, she's super big on right. Instagram. She is. Um, so, but you know, that it's, it's a job again, I keep keep going back to it, you know, it, it's work. And so when it's work at times, it mm-hmm. can just get really, really tiring. So, right. all right. Uh, let's move on to some other, some other segments. What else? I'm just, this is literally how this, how this podcast is going to go. I'm just going to continue to, <laughs> to just be like, all right, what's next? What's next, Nikki? Nikki, tell me what's next. <laughs> Right, no, just the 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 to transition smoothly from that, John. Like it is work, no matter how glamorous or how fun a job looks like from the outside. But what matters really is that you're passionate, you're obsessed about your work, and that's what I remember from what uh, you talked about with uh, with Brian Medeiros. He's a YouTuber who does shoe history videos, and he was talking about how you have to love your craft. In order to be successful, so no, no matter how much burnout you get, or how how stressed you get from your job, like she, he was talking about, how it's imperative that you're obsessed. There's there should be a bit of obsession with with your craft and with your passion for you to be for you to go somewhere, get places um, with your job. So yeah, that's what I liked about what he said. And you also you guys th- also talked about. Um, the resistance. Um, I, I think it's from a book that you referenced, the art of oh, the, the art of art, the war of art, not the art of war, the war of art. The art of war, Sun Tzu. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and he, you guys were talking about how starting is always the most difficult part of the the creative process, and I guess it's true for all creators. Like you have this idea, but it's also the execution um, that's 
the most difficult part of creating? Yeah, everything was, you know, like I remember the first video I watched on YouTube was called, you know, how to edit on Adobe Premiere in tw like in 20 minutes or something like that. And I just was like, it just uh, it became addictive. Like, I don't, I don't know if you can relate, but when you start learning like a new program or just anything new, you just want to learn more and more about it and you want to master it. And I've always been like very obsessive and very like, when I get into something, I get into it pretty extreme. And uh, it, just, it was just kind of like a rabbit hole, video editing. And uh, I even made another YouTube channel with my other brother who has the passion for cooking and barbecuing. And I was like, let's just do, and I, and I was too insecure to make my own channel. I eventually did, but I just turned the camera onto my brother. So I made like cooking videos with my brother. I made the sneaker videos with my brother. It really just became like, yes, yeah, so I had to self, I, there was no way, I went to school for music and there was no way I was gonna go back to college for videography or for photography or something like that. I just had to teach myself. And through teaching myself, I've really gained a lot of um, a lot of appreciation for like f other YouTubers and film and sneakers, like I said. And uh, it's really been a it's been a good like four years now of just like trying to improve constantly every video, you know. And uh, you know, and that literally just starts with like going to YouTube and be like, like uh, how do you how do you make the audio sound clean on a uh, on a on a video, or how do you you know it just it definitely self taught hundred percent and uh, it's it's amazing I love it I, it's like an an obsession to teach yourself constantly it doesn't even matter if it's video editing anything where where does that come from for you personally you, you that's something that's just you've always kind of had your entire life just this desire to teach yourself things yeah for sure uh since i was a kid i think skateboarding had a lot to do with it uh i'm right now i'm working on a video on the uh the rise of uh, do you know dc shoes yeah of course so they're a very iconic brand and they have a lot of history and uh and uh, i'm working on a hit uh, i don't know if you've seen our videos on youtube uh, but we do a lot of like sneaker history videos and i want to do one on um on the history of DC. So I've been studying it and I've been like getting closer and closer to like my childhood and reliving these skateboarding moments. And I realized as I was watching this, that sk skaters, uh, if you've ever seen a skater in the street or if you've ever skateboarded yourself, you can relate to uh, just instant failure, right? So, cause you're like trying this trick and you're trying to learn this trick and you're falling and you're falling and it's painful and you're falling and it's over and over and you're obsessed with getting it right. And you'll even land the trick sometimes and even after you land it, it's not like the way you want it, right? So you have to um, do it over and over and, and it's kind of obsessive. Like I know, I know uh, there's a pro skater named Andrew Reynolds. Um, he taps his board like three times. Like he, on the tail of the board, he'll go like one, two, three before he like does this trick because he just has like OCD. Like he doesn't think he's gonna land this trick. And I think it really stems from from like, I think it's becoming more and more clear to me that it stems from, from uh, being a kid skateboarding and just having to have things perfect before going for a trick, you know, and uh, just being obsessive. Like I've always been obsessive. Like I, I won't, I won't drink, you know, alcohol because I know what that's gonna lead to if I like, ooh, get into like whiskey or I get into craft beers, like <laughs> because I know I'll just get obsessed with it and. You know, alcoholism isn't al alcoholism isn't a uh, is just the worst thing ever. So I I don't drink at all, zero, because that's my personality. You know. <laughs> gotcha. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm just like obsessive by nature. Always have been since I was a kid. Yeah, it's it seems like something that could be both a gift and a curse, right? Because you can get really really good at something, but then like you said, if you get obsessed about the wrong thing, it could lead to negative consequences but like in creative stuff like this making videos or even when you you did music like that kind of obsession is really super useful to have in order to get good at this yeah for sure i get people who ask me like uh well i, I mean i'm trying to sound like i'm a big shot but i'm not i'll get like co-workers or friends who ask me like yo how do you do youtube videos or how, how the hell did you get ninety thousand subscribers like 
I want to do that. I can do that. And I'm like, yeah, you can. And I like kind of lay it out for them and they never start or they start and they get frustrated because it's too hard. And, uh, and it's because they don't, I mean, I don't, everybody has their own reasons, but f the reason it worked for me is because I have this like burning desire to like solve this creative problem. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm going to like go to sleep at two in the morning, I got to figure it out. And, uh, and I think that's, um, it's definitely a, a good uh, skill to have or a good uh, tendency or gene, I guess, to, to have if you want to be doing creative work. You know, you got to be obsessive. If you're not obsessive, uh, if you don't feel like you love it, like if it doesn't bring you, ha the process doesn't bring you like happiness or it doesn't feel like, you got to be, you got to be obsessive, right? If you want to be successful in something, I think personally yeah that I, I really enjoyed that conversation with brian because i wasn't even expecting him to go down that path mm -hmm. of us talking about he was asking me about like how i mm -hmm. deal with you know the inner voice i guess in my head uh, when it comes to being creative and so i just found that like I really wasn't nikki like at the beginning of that episode i wasn't anticipating i think we might have spent like 15 minutes or something i don't know we'll, we'll we'll have to fact check this and look back at the tape eventually but it, it felt like a long time i was like in my mind i remember thinking to myself like wow i wasn't expecting to spend this much time talking about like <laughs> concepts like the resistance and and how to fight right. inner, inner battles with procrastination and <laughs> and and getting started because it is it's really difficult like and i you know as I stated, like I, you know, prior to doing this, I've done more writing in recent years. Um, mm -hmm. And, and writing can be such a challenge because like you said, before the clip played, like you have this idea, but then the next step is mm -hmm. trying to execute on that idea. And, you know, you're, you're constantly having to like, for lack of better terms, like massage the idea, like, you put it on paper, but then maybe like it doesn't, you thought that was a good idea. And then upon further reevaluation, like, oh, maybe this isn't that good. Or maybe it just hasn't struck right. you yet as to how to best communicate and execute that idea creatively. Right. And it's, it's difficult for, for creators to have to, to think of new ideas every time. And just going back to what, um, do what Martin Wong said. It's it's a repetitive process. It's an ongoing cycle of creating. So it's something that creators have to deal with on a regular basis, having to deal with that resistance and you know have to fight that in order to really finish your projects. And I remember Brian was talking about how he has to take a walk, he has to take a nap in the middle of the day in order to be productive. And I think these are things that we really have to take seriously to avoid burnout too as as creators, as people in general who have jobs, you know. Yeah. I that is that, that is something that I actually I, I took a walk today, actually, and thought of Brian <laughs> as I was taking a walk. Because I remember him saying that, yeah, I go on like a lot of walks, you know, just try as much as possible to to go on walks to uh, to clear my mind, you know. And it really does. Like, you, you think about it, you know, I mean, you think about it and it may seem like, especially when you're busy, like, oh, I don't have time to walk. But mm -hmm. like setting aside like 10 minutes or something to walk around your wherever you live whether you live in a house you walk around your neighborhood or if you live mm -hmm. in like an apartment building or something you walk around that neighborhood i mean just getting outside okay. uh, helps because you know what like a lot of times i think with creativity and you can tell me if you if you feel this way yourself with in terms of doing creative work is most of the work is done not in front of the laptop screen, like not in front of the word processor or actually when you sit down to like write something, a lot of it is done right. like in the moments where you're just capturing ideas or if you're just like in the shower, you know, it, or, or, right. or going for a walk. Like those are the moments when, when mm -hmm. it's happening or even when you're sleeping, like I can't tell you how many times I've just gone to sleep mm -hmm. and then the next day, 
you know, after being challenged with with a, you know, by by a certain piece of work that I'm trying to create, like it's all there. It mm-hmm. just comes flowing onto the page. Right. You never know when when inspiration is gonna strike, really. And yeah, but yeah, like what you're saying, it doesn't. You don't really plan when you get these ideas, but. Another struggle, I guess, for creators is that sometimes these moments of inspiration never come and you really just have to work on it. You really have to think of an idea, like, intentionally in order to create a project. But, but yeah, it's one of the many, the many um, struggles, I guess, as content creators. And just to go to Owen, what Owen Hemsath um, said in your conversation with him, another... Um, another struggle that well not really a struggle but but something that content creators should be doing is like he was talking about how you can stand out online or how you can stand out on YouTube and he was saying that you have to do that thing that nobody else can do like he was saying that if you can play the trumpet and even if your channel doesn't have anything to do with playing the trumpet like make a trumpet music intro or whatever, you know, just inject your personality into your videos. And he was talking about how he started incorporating like his kids in the in his videos. Like if his child is eating ice cream in the background, like he wants to capture that. And I think that's something that sometimes I guess we overthink um content creation or when we're on camera, sometimes we overthink our words. Sometimes we forget to just be ourselves and just make jokes on camera or you know be silly and that's something that we have to let ourselves have fun with because if we don't then it's just it's like we're just robots you know on camera (laughs) saying words like we have to let ourselves be ourselves i guess that's that's really what um stood out to me with um your conversation with with owen owen video great let's let's rewatch that clip right now so Think about the things that you're good at that nobody else can do the way you can. You know, if you're an SEO guy and, and, and you're, let's say you're an SEO guy, but you play trumpet, just something like random, okay? Then you should be playing trumpet in your videos, right? You should be the background music or maybe you have a magic trumpet. You know, let's ask the magic trumpet. And it's just these short little things that add personality and character to your video because nobody else can play trumpet, right? Who else is doing that? For me, I have beautiful kids, right? And they love to be on camera. So I try to put my kids into my videos as often as we can. And sometimes it's very natural. The other day we're filming a video and Scotty walked in. She wants, she wanted a ice cream. And so I, you can see it in my latest video. I had the camera, I said, I said, get her on camera and just record this. And, and we did, and it was short and sweet and fun, but it's like, it's something that nobody else can do. Right. And so you've got to find ways like what are those passions inside of you? Is it crafting? Is it quilting? Are you a great singer? Right. Because you don't have to start a singing YouTube channel if you don't want. But if you're going to start like a, you know, like a, a, an SEO channel or a channel about audio gear, or maybe you want to talk about like, you know, auto mechanics, then sing in those videos somewhere. Right. Find a way to put what you love into your videos. I waited way too long to start doing that, and that was the biggest mistake I made. When did you start doing that? Like two weeks ago. <laughs> no, you know, it's it, okay. So I did a series of videos right before I got canceled the first time. And uh, and uh, that those videos had comedy in them, right? And I really liked those videos. They didn't have as much comedy. I wasn't like unleashed. But now we're starting to add little skits into our videos and we're trying to like show off my humor a bit more and my quirkiness. And it's really, really working for us. You know, the results that we're getting are, are skyrocketing our channel. And so like I go to these, like I've always been so serious, right? I've always been so, so serious because, you know, I came from drugs and alcohol, came from the street. Who's going to trust me, right? All those Orange County kids told me I was dirt and trash, nothing right? I had no trust fund. I didn't go to Fullerton. So I was always so serious that they would take me seriously. But I'll tell you, um, those 
there's nothing wrong with those guys. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, well, screw them. I make more money than they do now. And, and that is true in a lot of cases. You know, a lot of these people that used to make fun of me have the same sales job they had 20 years ago, which is fine. That's amazing for you. Great. I'm glad your life worked out. I'm glad you didn't turn into a cokehead Orange County kid. You know what I mean? But their opinions no longer motivate me. And my goal is to be the best video creator that I can be. And I'm learning more and more about how to do that every single day. Yeah, that conversation, Nikki, with with Owen was was great. Um, I might have asked him like fewer than 10 questions, but he was able to fill like the entire hour that we spoke just because he he has a lot to say and he's very knowledgeable about um you know the world of of uh content creation and video creation so that was uh that was a very fun conversation as well all of these are fun but i i learned a lot from him honestly the the thing that really stuck out to me from that conversation other than his story and i won't spoil it for any of you who haven't listened to the episode mm -hmm. if you haven't then you want to go back to episode four of the video craft show right. podcast and just owen tells this incredible story of his life which is very fascinating and interesting of how he got to where he is today um but the one thing that really stuck out to me was talking about how you know looking at content as like a table and like different topics is like legs of that table right and and just kind of building upon that over and over again. I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah, he was talking about how you you shouldn't have just one type of video because then if that that um if that type of video doesn't really work out for you, um then your channel will die. So he was saying that he has experienced that in the past. So you have to have sort of different categories within your channel like um different uh not just like for example if you're if you're a music artist like you can't just do covers of songs maybe you do tutorials or maybe do vlogs so you have different sorts of videos in your channel so if so people have things to choose from i guess if one set of videos doesn't really work out for you so that's really helpful yeah for sure okay yeah. what's next nikki <laughs> Levi Kelly, he's a YouTuber who does Airbnb tour videos. Man, like he, like for his age, I think he's my age, 23, 24, around that age. 24. Oh no, I think he's 22. He's younger than you. you. Oh my gosh. Okay. Super impressive. Like he does these amazing cinematic, um, high quality uh, Airbnb tour videos. And, um, I don't know. That that's one thing that um, stood out to me when you guys were talking, like just realizing how young he was and that he's married and he's a homeowner. And I was thinking, man, I have to up my game. I have to <laughs> I have to buy a home for myself. <laughs> but yeah, you guys were talking about how he was doing one of these Airbnb videos, and he was, I think, he was doing um, uh, Raw Built's Airbnb. Another one of our guests that we'll talk about later on. But he was touring his Airbnb and he had his shoes on while he was sitting on the couch and people were <laughs> hating on him <laughs> for having his shoes on um, on the couch. And you guys were talking about how your deal he deals with, how Levi deals with um, negative comments. And he was talking about there were like 400 comments just about him <laughs> wearing his shoes <laughs> on the couch. And I like his perspective on how he how he deals with these um, negative comments. Like he, he doesn't really make a big deal out of it. And you guys were talking about how there's there's a difference between good feedback and bad feedback because, I mean, there are comments that don't really it doesn't really have a lot of substance like I don't know shoes on the couch. But there are also other comments that can maybe help you as a content creator. Like there were people commenting on how he should expand his vocabulary because he says I don't know he says really I forgot I forgot the cert the specific words that I said wow yeah wow because, <laughs> a wow <lot. laughs> yeah and I guess that's true for for people who are on cam on camera a lot in front of the camera a lot like you find yourself sort of using the same words over and over again I I'm sure a lot of 
content creators um, can relate to that. But yeah, I found that funny because you said that you have certain words that and phrases that you repeat over and over again as well. Yeah, I'm sure you're, you know, we've been working together now for a little more than a month, but over time, maybe you'll like pick up on like my <laughs> little quirky things that I, you know, vocabulary that I am redundant and say over and over again. So <laughs> anyways, let's check out that clip. I get a, I try to respond to, you know, the more clever comments. I read all the comments, like every single comment I read. So I try to respond to the more clever ones or if they have a question and I know it. But recently, a lot of comments. So on Rob's video, I did a tour of his tiny house, and it has like a million and 300,000 views right now. But I accidentally wore my shoes on the couch, and I wasn't thinking. There's probably like 400 comments of people complaining about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, man, how many people are going to comment about that? And some of them are like really mean over something so simple as my shoes on the couch. But... I think it's pretty funny looking back at it. How do, how do you deal with that, though? Like, sometimes, you know, with some of the... Like, that's that's something that is obviously funny, but I'm sure there are at times, like, people who are mean-spirited and not nice, and that's... It's just the nature of the internet, right? Like, there are just yeah. trolls everywhere. I mean, but it's so... Like, I never get it myself for being, like, a consumer. Like, obviously, it's great to have an opportunity to chat and talk with you um you know somebody that who i've whose videos i've watched most of your your viewers won't won't have that opportunity but i just never really quite understand the 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 thought process behind why people why people do that because at the same time like you're you're a person on the other end and you have feelings too. exactly yeah so many people especially on the internet just uh, post weird mean comments sometimes i get a lot about you know that i'm boring or like my voice sucks to listen to or just things like that but mo most of them are really good comments and people are really nice and that really boosts up i think the videos and i'm glad my audience is for the most part very very nice i'd say my core audience is all nice and it's just the random people that get on the video and just want to hate for whatever reason I don't let it bother me. I've never have. I think a lot of them are really funny because I'm like, you're taking the time to post a comment that nobody's ever going to see except for me and you. Yeah. No, that's a good attitude to have, man. Like, it's just kind of let it, it it's let it like slide off your shoulders. I, I feel like with, with content, with creating content for any platform, right? Like you want to have, you want to, be able to discern the difference between good and bad feedback, right? Cause like there's some feedback obviously that your audience is giving you that may spark ideas for you or, or tips in terms of how you can improve your videos. How do you go about, how do you go about doing that? For sure. Yeah. There are some people that do that. For example, in the beginning, even now I struggle with this, my, um, my, the words I use in my videos, the verbs, is not very broad. So that got noticed very, very quickly. And people call me, man, you need to expand your vocabulary or whatever. So, you know, that's not really a mean comment or anything. That's just something that I wasn't aware of since I'm the creator, not the viewer, I would say. So those comments are really helpful because I'm like, I'd rewatch the videos. I'm like, man, you're right. I said the word very or super or beautiful like 50 times in the video and it's probably really annoying. <laughs> so I either just... Cut back and try to precise what I say or maybe think of a few more creative words. That's the hardest part because I'm, I'm not very good at, I don't have a big vocabulary. And for something, that what I do, I need to know like the verbiage of some things. Yeah. No, I, it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because honestly, you know, we're still in the early stages of producing this podcast, but... I am super hyper aware now of like s repeating words or being like super redundant with, with certain things. I have a tendency, I think when I, when I, when I listen back to this tape um, and, and other interviews to say the word interesting a lot, or, <laughs> um, it sounds like, or imagine, I mean, you'll probably notice me try to make, make that, those yeah. kinds of transitions <laughs> in this interview, but and I, I say fun, wow like, a lot. <laughs> Wow. 
I'm sorry, what did you? And I say like, wow, way too much. Like when I'm talking to people, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that was, uh, I think uh, Rob did that in his video. He, he, he like spliced up Owen Wilson saying wow <laughs> when you saying wow. <laughs> Cause I it's, said that probably it's all in good fun 30 times in that video. Yeah. It's all in good fun though. It's all in good fun. Yes. Uh, Levi. <laughs> yeah. What, how amazing to me, like you said, when you, when you started and introduced him, it's, he's such a, he's a young guy. And look, there are a lot of young people who are like successful on YouTube. I mean, let's, let's not, you know, forget about the king of the moment, Mr. Beast. This guy has like 60 million subscribers <laughs> on YouTube. Um, and I think he has, and you think he's only 22 or 23. He might be the same age as Levi. So he's, he's like dominating right now, but yeah, Levi was really, um, what else stuck out to me about that conversation that we had was how he, um, you know, he started his channel. It was very random and all over the place. Like I remember going back and looking, Mm -hmm. looking at his, um, at his, uh, at his channel, his oldest videos and, and seeing, Oh wow. He's got like topic. He's got videos on minimalism. He's got videos on like his apartment and what's in it and whatnot. It's just kind of like mm-hmm. all over the board. Um, but mm-hmm. it was interesting that when he found that the Airbnb tour stuck, he, he, he kept doing them over and over again. You know, he was like, Oh, this works. So let me just keep, doing this because that seems to be what is gaining me traction. And I think that's one important thing, you know, for, for aspiring creators or creators who, who are even like, you know, long on their journey as is like, it's possible to change your niche. I don't think you necessarily need to know what your niche is from the onset of your channel based on my conversation with Levi and what he what he expressed. And then even like midway, like maybe at some point he's again, he's mm-hmm. young, maybe in like 10 years, if he's still doing YouTube at 30 in his early thirties, he doesn't want to do Airbnb tours. Maybe it's evolved into something <laughs> else. So I, I've seen other YouTubers who, who have done the same thing where they've, they've transitioned out from um, creating content. That is, um, you know, that was what their channel was originally about. And, and into right. something a little bit different. Right. YouTube channels definitely evolve over time. Like, I remember this one famous YouTuber, Jenna Marbles. I'm not sure if you know of her, but she does really random. Oh, yeah. I used to watch Jenna Marbles back in the day. Right. I love Jenna Marbles. I don't think she does YouTube now um, anymore, but it's so funny because her channel is just like so random like about her dogs or about her making DIY stuff and it has millions of views and I'm sure looking back like I don't know like if like I don't think she expected her channel to evolve that way and I think it's the same for for different creators as well like you never like maybe you start creating just for fun but um like once a certain type of video is successful and then you decide to keep making more of that and that's when you sort of start re-strategizing and think hey maybe i should make more of these videos because this is what people like and and then it just changes along the way you know so and i am i'm remembering what um rob said like another guest um that john had on the show another youtuber who does airbnb and house tour videos and tiny homes uh, he was saying how um, when you're starting off on YouTube, um, you shouldn't like just use your phone camera before you invest in in more expensive gear because, like like I said, like we were talking about earlier, you don't know if your concept is gonna work. Like maybe you have an idea, but you don't know which of your ideas will re- will like you don't know which idea people will like or which video people will like or which video will be successful so he was talking about how you should do videos make videos on your iphone let's say first before investing in in an expensive camera because you don't know if your if your concept will will work if you don't test it out first here's one of the truths about youtube um i have started a channel i'm doing okay and a lot of people you know reach out and they ask me you know what what's my advice they want to start channels i've convinced four people to start channels. Um, of all the people that have come to me and started their channels, 
Um, I would say 50% of them never uploaded their first video. The other 50% of them uploaded one or two and then stopped. So, you know, as much as I would love to say go out and buy a nice camera, go buy the Canon M50, whatever that is, um, you know, most likely, like, you, you really have to, like, know if that's what you want, you know? Because I'll tell you what, whenever I first started a YouTube channel, you know, well, actually, I start. I almost started a YouTube channel, like, let's see, what's it, we're in 2020, 2017, 2018, I bought two GoPros, and I bought a, a Canon Rebel T3i, and, you know, like, I was like, I'm going to start this channel, and I spent, like, four or $500, I was like, asked my wife, I was like, is it cool if I spend $500, and she's like, yeah, just, you know, I was like, it's, it's going to be for my dreams. Well, I never started that channel. Um, and all that stuff sat and collected dust for like a really, really long time. I never used any of it really. And that's because I just didn't test the concept out. And once I actually got behind, behind the camera, I was like, eh, this concept, this concept sucks or whatever, you know, and I kind of walked away from it. So whenever someone wants to start a channel, I'm like, look, if you're serious about it, start on your phone, give yourself 10 videos, go through the editing process, learn why you don't like your phone. And then from there, you can think about buying a camera. I thought a phone was great. Like it's 1080p, you can even shoot in 4K. I was like, you know, why do I need a camera? I'll just get the new iPhone, right? Um, which funny enough is more expensive than my camera. But regardless, you know, I was like, an iPhone should be fine. But as I started trying to get footage off of my iPhone and like trying to figure out the easiest way to get you know, really giant size files from my iPhone to my computer was so frustrating. And that's what it, a lot of the time was me w waiting for files to come off of my iPhone and go onto Dropbox. Or I bought a little USB drive that connects to it. And it was really taking me hours. And I was just like, I like went to my wife and I pleaded. I was like, please, you don't know what this is doing to my health. And she's like, I don't care. Go buy the camera. If you notice the, the central th thread here is I hate spending money. And so I always like, I'm hoping that someone tells me not to because like I deeply want to like buy things, you know? And that's what it was with the camera. I was like, I really wanted it, but I was like, I don't deserve it. Like I haven't proved myself on my channel, you know? And yeah, once I bought that camera, that was my commitment to myself that I was gonna be a YouTuber, you know? Um, and so, but it was only through figuring out that recording on an iPhone is just not really feasible long-term. It worked for six months, but past that it was really eating into my workflow. So, you know, yeah, I, I, fancy cameras and everything like that, they're nice, but you really have to learn for yourself, A, if you're serious about this, and B, if your concept works, because it may not work. Yes, uh, I, I really admired that. And I think that's that was poignant advice that Rob shared with the audience of the show. Um, and that, that video that, he, that went viral that he talked about, that was the video that I think I had discovered his content. Like, um, that's what ended up showing up um, for me initially, um, you know, in terms of seeing his, finding his channel. And I, I remember watching through it. Like, I, I thought like, wow, his, you know, the angles of, in which he's shooting, like it's too high up. Like it's, it's like, it's just like chest level here. Like he's, he's, he's framing the shot wrong. But the thing that stood out to me was like, this guy is a character. He is entertaining. Like, he just had a personality that was clearly likable um, and it shined in his video. And that probably, that might have been like one of the things that you'd have to think that that had to be a factor in in why that video went viral. You know, it's like people saw it and they stayed engaged with the video because he was an entertaining dude and had and was communicating his ideas very clearly and articulated them well. Right. Um, so yeah, it was that was a fun interview. He was he was definitely um, you know, a guest who I'd love to have on on the show at a, at another point in time. I hope he doesn't get too big for us at some point cuz I I really do believe that <laughs> Rob is is on his way to becoming like a YouTube superstar as long as he sticks to it. He's in a really cool niche um in terms of like Airbnb rentals. It's a it's and and real estate, you know, there's that's a profitable um content mm -hmm. channel that he has going for himself um and i think even since then like his his channel has like gained like another fifteen thousand 
or or twenty thousand. Oh he's such I a personality. Again, fact he's check funny. me on this. He's entertaining to watch. Yes, yes. I mean, and it makes sense. This dude, like, w- other thing that stood out to me from that was when he told me that um, <laughs> he uh, he grew up wanting to be a commercial jingle writer, like. <laughs> Right. You know, he wanted right. to be you the guys guy. Are talking about Barry like, Manilow. Yes, I brought up Barry Manilow because <laughs> I'm old now. <laughs> like I, <laughs> it, I, I really am. Like I, I listened. I listened to Barry Manilow like religiously. You know <laughs> it, it, that. Look it up. Very strange medley on YouTube. Search it up. Put it. Put this in the show notes, Nikki. Very strange medley. <laughs> in case we, in case they missed it on the last episode. Um. And so I just found that really fascinating that he was, he was, because most, most people don't, most people who are creative, like say, I want to be like an actor or I want to be in movies or I want to be, you know, um, a a, a television star or a a musician. Like, I don't know many people who are like, I want to write the jingles that are, that people (laughs) hear in in ads. So (laughs) that was really fascinating. But anyways, let's move on to the next guest. Right. We had um, Marielle Hen- Heno. Is that how you pronounce her name? Heno. 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 We had her and she's a, a business owner for Mermaid Tales. And she does mermaid classes where you can learn how to swim like a mermaid. And he's one of, she's one of our, um, our longtime clients. And she's such a nice person. And she was talking about how you, like she, even if, she didn't have a lot of views on her videos. She would still be making these videos because she enjoys making them. Like she said, she was going to make them anyway. And I think that's a good mindset mindset to have um, when you're creating things online is that you shouldn't make it with the mindset that you. it's because you want people to listen to it. Like, sure, you want people to listen and to watch your content. But before that, it's... It should be mostly about how, because you enjoy creating this thing, you like writing this thing, you enjoyed filming this thing, and then you know it's it's just a bonus if people liked what you make. And yeah, I, I remember this random movie line from <laughs> so relevant, but I think it's from Sydney White. Like there was that character there. He said that he was he had this like random online blog that nobody reads and he he met like this one fan of his and he was saying that his blog it was meant to be written not read so i guess that's a good mindset to have with creating like you make it with the purpose of creating it and then it's just a bonus if people actually like what you what you make yeah i would say do a youtube channel about something you love that you would do the video for yourself first. Like I do mermaid videos, even if nobody was watching, I would do, I would do them because I like doing them. And this is a good way for you to be constant because it's, it's enjoyable. Um, don't do them for like the money. Uh, the YouTube ad revenue is not big. Uh, you mainly do it, the money that you will make from your videos or from other product like i make mermaid videos i can sell mermaid tails that's how i make mer- money from it i sell mermaid swimming lessons but it's not from the ads directly um and yeah find successful youtubers and hang out for them offer them your time for free to help them and learn from them i think being with su- successful people is the way to go then and yeah, just keep trying different things and do what, enjoy making your videos itself. Yeah, that's that's so critical. I think it's just like really loving the process of of what you do. I think that's like so applicable across whatever platform, whether it's YouTube or if you're running a blog or if you're doing a podcast or something, you kind of just need to be able to do it for free. And again, it's it's yeah it ties back to like your business you just you just like these things you were just very interested in those in swimming and you were interested in 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 mermaids and and princesses and you just like if the business didn't work out you probably i imagine you would still be like at the pool swimming with these mermaid fans right yeah i think that's the same like like youtube is like a small business but 
I just enjoy it. And because it like for my, just the business, like it took me two years of not paying myself a salary before it, it became successful. Then it's, it's hard work, but if you like it, it's, if you don't feel like you're working, like it's just really fun and people share your passion. And that's why a lot of business fail because people after a year, they're like, huh, this is not working. And, and that was something that um, a partner run a business. And after a year was like, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. It's okay that you're not making profit and like, you're just working things out, but like you need to have someone that knows business and say, Hey, no, keep working on it. You're exactly where you should be. Yeah. Nikki, I, I, I really like that clip also. Um, and, and just what she said, you know, that's, that's very poignant. And it's something also, I think Rob had mentioned in, in my podcast with him. And I right. think it's one thing we'll probably see from like a lot of these successful creators and ones who've, who've figured out how to stick with it long term. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just enjoying the process of doing it, you know, just doing it for the sake of doing it and, right. and not really like seeking seeking a certain kind of result. Like if you're so focused on, you know, going viral or whatever, when you don't go viral, then you're going to be disappointed. You know, if you don't reach like a million subscribers, you know, after doing like a thousand videos, it's you're going to end up disappointed. So, you know, that right. is... That is definitely something that, um, you know, really stuck out to me about that episode. And she was very, um, I just found it really fascinating that she found this really like unique niche that right. there really isn't much competition in. And she's just dominating. She's just living it, her life, you know? her and, best life. Yeah. She's built a successful business out of it too, expanding, right. expanding worldwide into different places, not just Canada where she's from in Montreal, but like elsewhere in the United States. And I think potentially in, in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. So, all right. What, uh, what about the next episode? Right, what, we what, had, what did you um, enjoy there, We Nikki? had Doug Cunnington next and he is a project manager. And you guys were talking about how if saying, subscribe like and comment is really effective because when i watch um videos that like i just want to get information from like maybe tutorial videos that i I have a technical problem or whatever i just want to get straight to the point i don't want like desiree also touched on this later on like she was saying that you can't start a video with like hi guys so today blah 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 blah," and you go on this like 30 second (laughs) like rant about what the video will be like doug was saying that you just have to get s- straight to the point of the video and like people will subscribe if they like you like you don't have to say it like he was saying how it's mostly just tuned out at this point because everyone says subscribe like and comment over and over again so you guys were sort of talking about is it really effective to still say that or is it more effective if you just go straight to the point of the video Another thing that I, you know, wanted to dial back into that you had mentioned a moment ago was just coming up with um, YouTube video content ideas based on blog posts. Now, are you going into like your Google Analytics and seeing on your blog, hey, these particular topics perform the best? They got the the like the the read time or the dwell time was longest. They got the most page views. And then you're thinking, okay, maybe I should create a piece of content around that on YouTube, or are you doing something else? Usually it was a thoughtful analysis on the content and the topic. And I wanted to get certain viewers who are interested in the topic of things that I was selling. So I sell courses, so I wanted to make sure I was publishing content that would pull in the people that would potentially buy a course. And it's important to mention that because I have content on my site, which is irrelevant for those kind of people. It may be, um, you know, something that I wrote that I was interested in a few years ago. It may actually get a decent amount of traffic. It may rank well, but it doesn't align with the, the funnel to actually make sales. So really I would just make sure that I'm, I'm publishing the content 
to pull in the right kind of audience member who may want to work with me in the future. That That's the biggest thing. And coupled with that, some of the topics that I cover have very good um, tools that I can offer up for free, like a spreadsheet. So this is where the email list building really comes into play. So some of the videos that did well uh, that I'm referencing in that HubSpot article, they were around keyword research and I shared my template. The, the keyword research template is just a Google sheet. So it was super effective in getting people to actually subscribe to my email list. A lot of people will call this a content upgrade. It's sort of a specialized kind of lead magnet and it's a the free resource that is 100% related to the topic that you're covering and it makes it you know easier to do or faster and it's a useful tool. So it's like a no brainer if someone's interested in that video, interested in those keyword research topics, they will want that spreadsheet. So just sign up for the email list and you get free access to the spreadsheet. Yeah, he was fun. He was again, I keep saying everybody's fun. Like now I'm getting <laughs> redundant like like Levi is. <laughs> but he you know, Doug had some really some really great wisdom to share aside from that. And I and and, and you know, I think um one of the things that stood out to me about that particular conversation and why I wanted to have Doug on the show was because he's very systematic, you know, right. he, 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 he knows, and we're doing this too. You're probably noticing it as you, you're following the show is like, he's a master of like repurposing content. Like he does a podcast like us, not focused on content creators, obviously, but you know, he is, um, he is, he does a podcast and then he, from that podcast, he turns it into multiple little clips, right? right? And so he's he's just he just knows that you know there's there's something to be said about taking one piece of content, one piece of long form content, and just stretching it like mm-hmm. a mile um, rather than mm-hmm. like you know an inch. Um, and I think that's something that you know, is worthwhile for content creators to to keep in mind because, you know, like we talked about earlier, it can be really hard to come up with inspiration for new ideas if you're constantly having to like make something new and reinvent the, you know, invent the wheel. Well, rather than like invent the wheel, why not just reinvent it instead? You know, right. and I think that is, that is something that he, he does very well. Yeah, so, and I can see that he's very um, let's strategic m- too with, um, with, um, the content that he makes because he said that he purposefully analyzes his topics and his content and he sees um he checks sort of like what sort of content can he make that would attract certain people to to buy his courses from him so i guess that's another aspect too if if you're dependent on youtube for for money or if if you're making a living out of it is you can't really just depend on on the ads like if you're selling something or you're selling a service like you have to strategize on what content um you can make um that will attract the specific people you think will want to buy your service or your course or whatever so i like that i like the way he talked about that as well yeah, even though he is um, you know, he he is definitely like an entrepreneur first. Yeah. But, you know, there's there's something I think that even if you think of yourself as a creative or a creator and you might not think, "Oh, I'm I'm not really into business. I don't really care about that. I just do mm-hmm. this for the passion of it." Like it it can be fun. Like you can find you can find creativity in like thinking about things systematically mm-hmm. and and from a business perspective, um, I, I I truly do believe that. So, you know, that right. is that's something that he really espoused in in this particular episode. Um, let's go ahead and um, move on to the next episode. What's something that stood out to you about my conversation with with Monty Weaver? Right, like um, like Doug Monty, like he is a I think he's a technician first and foremost and he started um making videos on youtube and he didn't expect that these videos would um 
would be successful. Um, he's also a digital marketer, I guess. I think he's in advertising. And he uh, was talking about how you have to pay attention to what people are saying in, in the comment section because he said that, um, I guess he's a rel- uh, relatively new content creator so he's sort of still learning and um he was saying that you have to listen to your viewers so you can improve and get new video ideas too from the comment section like if um you can if you're running out of ideas like you can go to your comment section if people are asking for tips and other things that you may be knowledgeable on that like that's a good um source to get ideas from and also he was talking about the rule of 50 like i get i think people come up to to monty and ask him like how do i be successful like how do i get successful on youtube and he was talking about how you have to get your first 50 videos up first before worrying about um how you're gonna have thousands of subscribers or views or whatever so he said that you should focus first on uploading more and more content before worrying about the metrics Cool, let's play a clip from Monty. I pay a lot of attention to the comment section. And that's how I've really learned my audience more on that personal level. Um, You know, I definitely pay attention to analytics. Uh, One thing that I love about the YouTube platforms, it gives you analytics of where people are watching from. So I know locations, I understand uh, age demographics, click through rates, all that is great and something to definitely pay attention to. But as someone that does a lot of tutorial videos, I have to understand, is my message clear enough? Is it concise? Is it... Uh, able to actually help them. And so when I pay attention to the comment section, it really lets me know who is watching. Because, you know, when you teach, if anybody that's ever taught before, you know, you don't understand uh, automatically the person's knowledge level, especially if they're a complete stranger, which is, you know, this online world. So I don't know if I'm talking too elevated or too low So being able to pay attention to comments kind of keeps me in that sweet spot where I understand, okay, this information, this last video might have been too, too much information. Let me bring it down a little bit. Let me make it more concise. Let me break it down a little bit. And so the comments really allow me to understand, okay, my audience needs basic information to get them started or to help them take one next step up. They don't need very complicated statistics of how things work. They just need, actually need to see it. Which cable do I need to buy? And that's what I'm going to buy. Which camera do I need to buy? And that's the one I want to buy. They don't need a whole bunch of the the information's techie people like. Uh, that's just confusing to them. And so I make sure now when I do my videos that I keep it simple. You know. You will understand my video by the time you're done watching it. I, I watched one of your your videos too recently um, where you talked about content ideation. And it's interesting that you talk about the importance of comments to understand your audience. But I remember in that video, you talking about comments as being a really good source for for content ideas too. Exactly. Yeah. So if, if, if there's something that I might have left out on a video or something that wasn't clear, that allows me to create another video. I can go a little bit further onto that subject. You know, live streaming is the most popular thing in the world in uh, this year. And so when I read comments, you know, when I create the video, I know in my mind how I'm gonna create this video, what I'm gonna teach. But that comment section, if there's a question in there, I can expand upon that. I can create another video. I, I can teach more people and help more people. And especially if you see multiple comments about the same thing, that's just a good indication that, hey, we have questions here. Can you help us in creating that next video or that next post or you know, updating your community and getting that specific question answered definitely allows you to create more content and further understand your audience. Yeah, Monty is, is definitely somebody like Rob who started on YouTube in, in 2020. Um, and he doesn't have like, um, a huge, huge audience, right? Like he, Mm -hmm. he's had videos go viral, which has generated him a lot of his, um, you know, a lot of his subscribers so far. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, he is somebody much like Owen who it really stood out to me, just the power of having like a small audience, you know, sometimes I think we tend to forget that, you know, the numbers on the screen are like actually people. 
So like when you have people thinking like, <laughs> oh, I don't have like a million or like 12 million subscribers yet. I only have like 50,000. It's not great, you know. Like, <laughs> you do realize that you have 50,000 people who have opted in to watch your content. You know, there's like, well, I have 50,000 people, but, you know, I only get like 4,000 views per video. You do realize that 4,000 people (laughs) have watched your video. Imagine if you were in like a field somewhere with 4,000 people surrounding you. (laughs) Like how overwhelmed would you be? Yeah. How overwhelmed would you be by that whole experience? You would be. You would be floored by it. But we have a tendency when we look at content and and when we look at what we're doing on social media is like, oh, I only have like a few few thousand followers. Like that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, you you've been able to capture their attention. I mean, and and all you need, and this is the big takeaway for me from from Monty, is you only need a couple to like um really make it viable for you um as a as like a mm-hmm. business generating funnel right so again i know that there are a lot of creators who may be like a little bit resistant to seeing themselves more than just like a starving artist like i okay i get that mm-hmm. because that's just the way historically things have been but um <laughs> you know these days it's possible really to to create content i think and and you know, just reach the smallest viable audience. I, I, I'm probably going to refer to that constantly, like throughout the duration of this show, however long it lasts, hopefully forever. Um, but just <laughs> really like reaching the smallest number of people and and engaging with them and and really touching them in a way that, you know, maybe they, they would say, hey, they might raise their hand and say, you know what? That, that book you're talking about writing, like I'll pay for that. I'll give mm. you $20 for right. it, you know? And now guess what? <laughs> you can just give that book to that person directly. You don't have any intermediary. You don't have, uh, right. you know, you don't have a publisher to deal with. You just have a direct relationship with that customer. So mm-hmm. that that's my little rant there off of riffing off of, uh, off of Monty. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's actually, let's, let's uh, wrap this up with uh, your thoughts on the episode with, with Desiree Martinez. Right. Desiree, she was an aspiring, she wanted to be an animator, I think initially before being a content um, marketing expert or a social media manager. Like she wanted to, draw and work at disney or be an animator and then i think um she switched gears when there was a i think a recession i was a uh, five years old so i have no idea when, when that happened but um she was talking about how yeah, you're a baby <laughs> I, I was a baby she was talking about how you have to be creative when you're um figuring out what you want to do in life and she was saying that she was at this um at this networking event and people were like old people (laughs) were asking her about about facebook and how how you can put the facebook page up and she was talking about how back then you can only um get on facebook if you have a university account um again i i was not around for that (laughs) i was in grade school maybe (laughs) or i don't know you were so young nikki (laughs) Like, that's what I remember about Facebook. I was one of the first waves of people on Facebook who, this is like a slight tangent, but I remember when I first heard about Facebook, I was on vacation. I had just graduated high school and got like a graduation trip. Thank you, mom and dad, to Hawaii (laughs) with one of my closest friends. And he, we were in our hotel room and he was... He he logged on to like the internet on the TV. Mm-hmm. Um, this was 2005. You know, <laughs> this is how old I am. Like, don't let don't let the Asianness fool you. Like, we don't <laughs> age, but I am old. I'm an older guy. <laughs> I'm in my 30s, people. So, um, we were watching. We, we I was watching him on uh, browse the internet, and he logged on to face. He logged on to Facebook. I'm like, what is that? He's like, mm. oh, it's uh, the Facebook. It's like this, uh, <laughs> this, this like website where you can you can like connect with people 
<laughs> on your college campus, you know, in advance. Right. So like I'm making connections with like potential people who might be my friends. And then my first right. thought was like, I don't even know if you remember this application. I'm like, why would you need that? We already have MySpace. MySpace, it, <laughs> it looks so boring too. It's just know, white. MySpace. You can't, MySpace, you can customize it. Like I could actually like, <laughs> you know, add, do HTML. I could embed YouTube videos. What is this? Facebook's just like blue and white. Right. It's boring. So that was a little bit of a the tangent. Let's go back to Desiree again uh, with what you were saying there. Right. Nikki. <laughs> Desiree was talking about how, yeah, she, like people were asking her how to use Facebook. And her friend said, hey, why not? Why not ask people to pay you for this Facebook stuff? Because she was knowledgeable on it. So that's where it all started. Like her being, uh, she's been a social media manager or a content marketing expert now for almost a decade. And she has her own, her own uh, company, um, all in one. And so uh, I guess it just really stuck to me because, um, Nowadays, like there are new jobs that didn't even exist a decade ago or 20 years ago. Like Levi Kelly, you guys were talking about how Airbnb and YouTube, they weren't even a thing in like 2001, 2002, like before 2005 when you when YouTube started. So Desiree was talking about how you have to be creative when you're figuring figuring out your your livelihood. So, so there. I want to ask you too about... Um balancing all these projects you know you 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 know you mentioned that you have all these different revenue streams income streams for yourself a lot of different you know you're balancing multiple plates here you know you're you're consulting you're also you you're an agency you're you're also creating this content and then you have your personal life too you have your family that you have to take care of you control your time right but at the same time there's a lot on your plate so do you have any unique practices or quirks or routines that kind of help you keep everything together? I really think that before I ask the question, I need to make sure that y'all know something really important. You have to remember, I'm 11 years into this business. So you can't compare my today to your beginning. You can't even compare my today to your, like, you're five. Like, it's a totally different situation. You know, year five of being a social media manager, I had a baby and I was growing a baby and I had this crazy idea for this agency in my first trimester where I'm just like exhausted and trying to keep my son alive and balancing military life. And I just had to do it. And I literally put my business together by myself where I not only was running my business and getting the leads, I also had to do the social media work I was selling to people. Like it was a whole thing. And I added each piece they talked about throughout any of this one at a time. I didn't just start a YouTube channel and say, okay, this is everything we're doing. Here's the book and a digital product and the membership and the affiliate marketing and the sponsorship and the YouTube ads and go like all at one time. Like it not was not like that. I don't want you to think that it is. It's, it's a stepping stone. Think about where you want to be 10 years into being a creator. And that will be like, your measuring stick or, you know, where do you want to be? Even if you want to talk about being a specifically a YouTube creator, where do you want to be three years into being a YouTube creator? I'm 10 years into my professional career. Right. So it's a different thing. But as far as like my secret to doing it, Oh Lord, it's, I always try to do the most time consuming and important thing first in my day. Um, my husband is PTSD. I have two kids that are uh, six and five. Um, I, my mother-in-law who is sick lives with me. And of course to pile it on, you know, we live in COVID and I bought a house. My life will hit, I usually will hit a point in at least two of my days every weekday where I have no control of my time. And if I don't do the most important task I need to do in that day first, that is of course going to be the day that something awful happens when I would have been done, you know, like two or three hours into my day when I should have been having that thing done and I bring procrastinating on it or whatever. And I'll like lose my day and I'm like, crap, I'm behind this project and I'm doubling up and I miss something. Like, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I have recently had a few weeks where I didn't have a YouTube video go up because I didn't get ahead on my schedule 
and all kinds of life was happening. So without that one tip, I don't know, like that's the one thing I have that I can constantly say is the one thing to do. The second thing I'd have to say is when you can, quite literally the moment you can outsource your work, whether it's talk, well, working with a company like Vid, uh, Video Husky to edit all of your YouTube videos for you, or working with um, a graphic design company like Design Pickle to take over that work or, or hiring a contractor to help you with some piece of the puzzle that is time consuming for you or a VA to help you with different things. These are systems that are in place to help you accomplish your goals because you're only one person and you can't do everything. If it wasn't for having a video editing service, it wasn't for having the graphic design service, it wasn't for having my VA, it was for having my contractors, I would have none of this. The moment I let go of work was the moment I was able to increase my income. Like most people really think that when you take on a financial commitment that they're losing money, when in fact, if you do it smart, you'll probably won't even know that you it's missing. So I would not skip a beat on it if, if I were you. <laughs> the thing really, Nikki, that's um, one of the things that really stood out to me in particular about that episode with Desiree was our conversation about, um, you know, what women have to go through. Um, and this is definitely a topic in future episodes that I am going to explore as we get more female creators on the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's something that I, I, I definitely want to do more of for sure. And it needs to be done more. It's like spotlighting um, female and minority voices um, in general in this space. And obviously Desiree, if you're not aware um, for those of you listening or watching, she has a great podcast. Go check it out. It's called The Women of YouTube. Um, it's a similar podcast to ours, um, mm -hmm. it, but she spoke. She focuses specifically on talking to uh, female creators. So I, I think, regardless of whatever gender you are, like that is a that is a show that um, you mm -hmm. definitely yeah. should listen to if you are a content creator. But um, it really was, you know. It's just interesting to hear her talk about the things that women have to deal with on a regular basis um, in regards to the comment section and, and the thoughts that they have to deal with um, in terms of how they look and how they're presenting themselves on, on camera. And, you right. know, like we were joking about this a little bit before, like the episode started, but I was like, Oh, Nikki, look at you. You got the makeup on. You look, <laughs> you know, looking, looking very right. pretty today. You know, you got, you got, you know, you got <laughs> dressed up for this. And me as a guy, like, I just, I was like, do I put on my <laughs> contact lenses or not for this? Do I shave like this little bit of stubble on my face or do I just leave it there? And I, <laughs> decided to leave it there i didn't shave i don't have makeup <laughs> on i clearly didn't put on my contact lenses either for this episode so you know as men we have to we have to understand that like women are dealing with very different circumstances than than we do like we we it's invisible to us like these things that 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 mm. women have to deal with and by hearing women like desiree speak about it and to and talk with other women about their experiences on it is, I think mm -hmm. it's, again, it's very important, um, especially in this day and age, you know, as, as human beings, we continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Desiree was talking about how uh, there is much more pressure, I guess, on women with regards to how they look on camera, like YouTubers. I, I mean, I guess 99% of women YouTubers I see online is um, you know, they have to have a nice outfit on, they have to have their hair done and makeup on. And I guess it's just not the same for men because you just you guys can just put on a shirt and comb your hair and call it a day. <laughs> but there's much more that's many more decisions for, for women to make and there's so much more pressure on on us like with regards to our appearance so it's nice that Desiree is giving voice to that concern and she she was also talking about how like 50% of 
of marketing professionals or women. And she was at this event. <laughs> there were like 10 guests. Like there was only one female guest. And she was saying how that's so wrong. That should not be the case. So it's just women like her that like, you know, they're really doing the work in terms of making sure that um, we're all represented in the digital space. So props to her. That's for sure. And again, this is something that we're we're going to be working on and, and making sure that we're spotlighting, <laughs> um, you know, different people with different perspectives, right? right. Like not just... Not, not not just like the dominant perspective here. I think I have to speak from that as well. Just being an Asian American, a, a, a minority in in America, you are you are Filipino, and so right. you know there is there's that that we have to we have to address and and cover. And it's just it's just to broaden our horizons. So, well, Nikki, uh, this was a pleasure. This was fun. This went longer than I anticipated. I think it's a good thing, though. Like. We just, uh, we just, I think this is like our meetings though. Like our meetings, I'm sorry, they go longer than like the 30 minutes on the calendar. I should just change them <laughs> to like an hour. <laughs> but I appreciate you or for two. humoring me. Um, and um, yeah, like uh, this was a great episode. And for anybody listening or watching, even though Doug Cunnington doesn't necessarily believe it's that important, make sure you like this video, <laughs> subscribe to the channel on YouTube, subscribe to our email list as well. It's one of the best ways to keep in contact with us um, and stay up to date with everything that we're doing here on the Video Craft Show. We deliver a once a week update of the show, plus some tidbits and news about uh, the creator space. So you can find that at videocraftshow.com. Um, just subscribe to the email list there and you'll be able to do that as well here on the um, on the show notes page for this particular episode. So thank you, Nikki, for doing this. Thank you, John. Thank you.